Ladies and gentlemen, today the men and women of the United States military, in keeping with one of the finest traditions, pay special tribute to Lieutenant General A.C. Roper on the occasion of his retirement after 42 years of honorable service to our country. The host for today's ceremony is Lieutenant General Charles D. Lucky, United States Army, retired. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the official party. Please remain standing for the playing of the national anthem and the invocation. Please join me in these words of prayer. <coughs> Lord, we invite you into these precious moments for you. We have gathered here today to not only recognize the service of A.C. Roper and to honor his family, who have stood by him all these years. We're also here to give thanks to you for making the seemingly impossible possible. The words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah on the eve of the destruction of Jerusalem, are a poignant reminder that even in the midst of what seems like a dead end, you remind us that there will always be brighter tomorrows. For you say, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. When A.C. Roper came into this world growing up in Birmingham, having a hope and a future from the perspective of an outsider looking in, seem perhaps like a dim prospect. But when a man takes the gifts and talents that God gives him and surrenders them to you in service, matching them with the needs of his community and his country and the world, there can be nothing but hope and a future. Lord, we thank you for walking closely with AC over these years. His legacy is a testament to your provision. And Lord, in the spotlight, Life in the spotlight can be so unforgiving at times, and I'm sure there were nights and moments in his career where he and Edith wondered how they were going to rise to the, to the heights when seemingly tossed to the bottom of the heap. But you became their strength, and as the words of the Apostle Paul testify to us, and they became their battle cry, if God is for me, who can be against me? Today is the day, A.C., Edith, Crystal, and Amber, along with an entire history and generations of ropers, stop and reflect not only about the many accomplishments achieved, but on the abundance of grace given to run the good race, and perhaps no better reflected in Psalm 40, 
I waited patiently and expectedly for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the horrible pit of tumult and destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, steady in footsteps and establishing my path. The story of A.C. Roper is really just beginning because he is at an age where wisdom and experience can mentor the next generation. Lord, may you fill the next few years with new energy, new mission, new hope, and a new future. We ask all these things in your holy name. Amen. Thank you to the United States Air Force Academy Winds and Padre Olive. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, I would like to introduce our guests of honor. Please hold your applause until all have been recognized. Lieutenant General Roper's wife, Mrs. Edith Roper, his daughters, Captain Crystal Roper Savage and Miss Amber Roper, his brothers, Mr. Avery Roper and Mr. Almetrius Roper, his sisters, Miss Tiffany Roper and Miss Devaney Slaughter, his sister-in-law, Miss Delphine Burns, General Stephen Whiting, Commander, United States Space Command. General Geg Gregory Guillaume, Commander, North NORAD and United States Northern Command, and his wife, Caroline. General Glenn Van Herc, United States Air Force, retired, and his wife, Marilyn. The Mayor of Colorado Springs, Mayor Yemi Mobilati. Sergeant Major James Porterfield, Command, Senior Enlisted Leader, NORAD and United States Northern Command. Command Sergeant Major John Sampa, United States Army, retired. Command Sergeant Major Jeffrey Darlington, United States Army, retired. Command Sergeant Major Elijah Moore, United States Army, retired. Additionally, I would like to welcome the reserve contingent that have traveled from across the country to be here. We are honored to have so many esteemed guests here for today's ceremony. We welcome all of the active and retired general and flag officers, senior enlisted leaders, friends, and family. Thank you for attending. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Lieutenant General Charles Lucky. Awesome to be back. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, let me start off by just reaffirming the welcome for, I want to get, I'll talk family a little bit later, but uh, John Whiting, John Gio, General Van Herc, sir, great to see you again. Uh, thanks for allowing me to come back to, the, I, this is the first uh, star, Space Command, star base I've ever been, had the honor of being <laughs> invited, invited to attend and, and get to, so uh, this is, a, this is, I'm overwhelmed, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed with, uh, with nostalgia, but I also noticed that there's a new icon or a new logo on the gates when they come in, so um, it's great to be here. Mr. Mayor, uh, it's wonderful to be back in, in Colorado Springs and in El Paso County. Um, I miss it very much. Chief, good to see you. Great job, right? <laughs> oh, the answer is absolutely. <laughs> and see, sorry, I didn't get to meet you last night, but uh, great to have you here. Appreciate you being here. Welcome. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is. It, 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 as much as it's, I, I'm overwhelmed with my own emotion being here f to honor uh, this amazing, magnificent soldier, his family, everyone who supported him on this journey so far. Uh, but it's also for me, as a former chief of staff of NORAD Northcom, back when this was an Air Force base, um, it's wonderful to be back in the presence of the joint community, my Air Force brothers, sisters, um, and, and most importantly, um, the NORAD Northcom team that some of you were here when I was here. Some of you remember me fondly, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> some not so much. Um, but 
for all of you who came, uh, I just, uh, on behalf of the Roper family, I want to say thank you for showing up. You know, we talk, we talk a lot about presence, about being there, and about showing by your actions uh, how you feel and what you, and what you revere and, and what you want to honor by your personal physical presence. And I know some folks had to fly through storms and planes got diverted and they got delayed and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, such is what comes with the efficiency of modern transportation. But um, to, on behalf of the whole Roper team, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for making the effort to show up. So here's kudos to all of you. To the, to the team that put this together, that supported this, this was the club when I left. It's the hub now. Some, some things changed a little bit, not too much. Good to see you. Um, but for the, for the protocol team to put this together, for the first office that supports the, the, the DCOM, um, well done. And uh, the complexity of what you're about to see in terms of military operations is significant, a uh, rival perhaps only by, uh, by a, a noble legal call. Um, in terms of the m moving parts, but um, well done and very well put together. So I want to um, I want to just talk for a few minutes about uh, family and about this 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 magnificent human being and the family that supported him. But I also want to talk about uh, the 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 vignettes and the and the consistency of theme that I've heard from family, from friends, from the faith community back at, at uh, Faith Chapel back in, in Birmingham um, about this leader, this soldier. And for those of us who've had the opportunity to serve with him, uh, most of these, most of these, but not all, but most of these attributes, uh, I don't think you'll find surprising at all. We, you hear over and over and over again attributes of General Roper. Don't worry, I'm, I'm not forgetting the family here. I'll get to that. Humble, calm, wise, caring, steady, curious, present. To those I'd add a couple of my own. I'd add, uh, I'd add reverent, which is a little different than humble. I'd add reverent, and, and I would add strategically empathetic. And uh, I'm happy to talk about that later as well. There were some inconsistencies, though, in what I've heard from family. And I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit to reconcile these things in my head, because if you listen to most folks, you're going to hear the same theme about General Roper over and over and over again. And for those of you who serve with him, you're like, OK, I got it. I know that. I know that. Tell me something I don't know. Well, last night I learned a couple of things I didn't know complicated individual. <laughs> According to one sibling, I'm not going to name names, very fastidious about his clothing. They didn't ever want it to get dirty. <laughs> Which didn't really surprise me until I heard from another sibling he was also willing to take a ball-peen hammer to a shell cartridge and detonate it. <laughs> so last night when I got back to the room, Julie was already asleep. She's back in North Carolina. She, by the way, wanted to be here very much, but couldn't be here. Um, so by this, this morning, I called her. I, you know, I'm confused now. I thought I knew Rope, but apparently he's got two different personality traits. <laughs> One is don't want to get my hands dirty, no muss, no fuss, and the other is yeah, give me a hammer and I'll smash a bazooka. <laughs> so I want to talk about two things. And I'll, and I'll keep this short, because there's, there's a lot of moving parts in this ceremony. But, uh, but I think I would be remiss, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a brother officer, as a fellow soldier, um, as a battle buddy. He, last night, by the way, he accused me of throwing him out of a room. I never threw him out of any room, ever. <laughs> I just sometimes release people from their duties when they're no longer needed, and I want them to go out <laughs> and enjoy the rest of their life. Sometimes I, I say things, Julie tells me sometimes I say things, and I'm, I mean it because I'm leading with love, but, but I, they take it the wrong way. I, sometimes people har harbor grudges for 20 years. I didn't know it. <laughs> but 
I would, so I mentioned leading with love, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much. It's something I've talked about a lot, but um, the two things I want to talk about real briefly with, about, about AC, uh, leading with love and the speed of trust. And I, that's a phrase I stole from Stephen Covey. It's not original with me. Um, and being able to move at the speed that trust affords. So, a little background. For those of you who are out here uh, on the front range with me from 2012 to 2016, uh, what you know is I spent four years out here at what I regard as the coolest binational slash combatant command in, in the entire U.S. and Canadian military. But I had come from three years on the Joint Staff and a year in, in Iraq before that, so I'd basically been gone from the Army Reserve for almost a decade when I returned to D.C. And going back to D.C., for those of you, anybody here who knows Julie, for, for going back to D.C. was, was tough because we really wanted to stay here. And when, when, when I was, because of ageism in the United States Army, I was thrown out at the age of 65. We wanted to come back here, but by then the prices had gone up to the point where it was no longer affordable. So we, we, we basically put our tail between our legs and went back to North Carolina. But I'm just kidding. We didn't put our tail. <laughs> but anyway, it was gone for a while. Very quickly, I realized that I was sort of an outsider inside my own community. And so it took me a little while because I, you know, I had felt pretty good about what, things that I've been doing. But I realized I really needed to be able to find talent internal to my formation, internal to our formation as America's Army Reserve, um, that I that I could count on, and that I could trust, and that I knew would lead with love. And. Without taking you through the whole chronology of everything, suffice it to say, um, I first did meet him in Birmingham. That is true. At the 81st, that is true. I never threw him out of any rooms, but I did meet him in Birmingham. So I knew him, and he was commanding a thing called the 80th Training Command at the time in Richmond, Virginia. And we had a little issue with a piece of paper that was, should have been processed according to the Secretary of the Army's conditions and terms and 35 days and had languished for a couple years. And uh, so I thought this was a good place to, as you would say, in the Air Force or the Navy fighter pilot community, do a little kill chain analysis. I said, why is something supposed to take 35 days, take over two years? General Roper was the commander of the 80th. We had a short conversation. Um, he was all on board figuring out, Roger, Roger, Roger. And in that conversation, I knew that A.C. Roper, whom I had known before, was still the same dude. And I could count on him, and I could trust him. And, and, and you say, how? I said, because anybody who knows this soldier knows when you talk to him, he's going to tell you straight up what the deal is, and he's not going to varnish anything. And I knew I had a teammate. Now, he isn't the only one in a formation of 200,000 soldiers. I'm not saying that General Roper was the only teammate um, that I had by any means. but. I will say this, he was a senior leader who continued to demonstrate over and over and over again the ability to move to the sound of the guns, to move to the ball, to flow, and always said, after checking, always after checking, would always say yes. So to you guys, and then I'll come back to him in a minute. So I, I just want you to know that your service to, to to the America's Army Reserve, to the United States Army, to the Joint Force, and, I, and I'll just say to, to, the, to the, American experience, the American experiment of sustaining a constitutional representative democracy by sacrificing this leader of character with the Army uh, for all these years and, and letting him do stuff that I asked him to do on behalf of all of us um, for saying yes and for supporting him in doing that. Because this, this is an all-volunteer force, and none of us, none of us could sustain the capabilities that are represented in this room without our families supporting us every step of the way. So I want to thank all of you for that. <laughs> so I'll cut to the chase. He went from the 80th to the 76th uh, 
was called the ORC, Operational Readiness Command. Response. It, uh, response. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I knew I knew Doug would. I knew Trey would correct me no matter what. Uh, Operational Response Command. You know, it's always had a hard time with the concept anyway, so it wouldn't surprise you that I had a hard time with the acronym. Uh, and and then from there, we did have a conversation. I called him at what, what sounded like an opportune time. As I think your response was, it just so happens uh, that he was up for doing something different. So then he came to Washington, D.C. So thank you for supporting him in doing that. And, uh, and then, of course, he went down to Fort Bragg and ran the other part of the Army Reserve. So thank you for supporting that. I, I must say that Somewhere early on in our relationship in the Pentagon, because it didn't really start till then, we realized that we were, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of binary synergy between two brothers in a way. We, we, the more we discovered each other's life history, there were some obvious differences, but there were some amazing similarities, not the least of which was both of our grandfathers served in the First World War, which was pretty cool. Um, but we, so I think he came up with a term, but it was law and order. And because you got, you had the cop and you had the lawyer, right? So law and order. And it, but it actually became, if you think about it, it's kind of a good organizing construct for a partnership, right? Because we're, we are similarly aligned in many ways. I would argue we're very similarly aligned spiritually, but we don't act the same way. Uh, and I'll give you a story real quick one about that. But, but the combination of the, 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 the confluence of sort of our backgrounds and our, our mutual, I think, understanding of some of the key points that were raised by many and, and all of the remarks that they made about him uh, made us a pretty cool team. And I know for one thing, um, I, the reason I continued to select John Roper to do stuff for America's Army Reserve is because I knew he was a, what I call a fire and forget weapon system. And I could, I could slew to other targets knowing that Rope was doing what, what we needed to do for the Army. And I, I don't know any higher compliment I can give any leader than to be trusted in what the Army refers to as mission command, to execute vigorously, to come back to hire if you have challenges or need guidance or resources, but to be absolutely confident in the organization's trust and confidence in him. So, so I'll, just, I'll leave you with a quick vignette about sort of moving at the speed of heat or speed of trust and, 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 and how he was able, because this is important for leaders, I think, to understand. He was able, I'm sure, in ways that I will never imagine or really understand, to mitigate some of the implications of having to work in an organization that's, that I'm responsible for running. Because um, I know sometimes I can have a little bit of energy and passion in it, and, and it comes out in ways that some people might even think was profane. But when we got into COVID, in, in, in the spring of 20, um, the Army Reserve came up with a concept, and I didn't come up with it. Uh, General Gwynn came up with it. But the idea was essentially to build out these augmentation forces that could go into community hospitals across the country and not bring a bunch of equipment, but just bring the capability, the medical capability that resides in America's Army Reserve. Because for those of you who don't know, over half the medical capacity in the entire United States Army, the United States Army resides in America's Army Reserve. So we came up with an idea, and the idea was to build out 15 of these teams. We called them Urban Augmentation Medical Task Forces. Say that three times fast. And, and then to be able to deploy them into places across the country. Stanford, they went to Stanford, Connecticut. They went downtown Philadelphia. They went to Detroit. They went to Boston. They went all over the place. And they went into, into, into the mid-Atlantic states as well. Anyway, the idea was to do it and to be able to do it quickly. So we, we committed to being able to stand up and deploy 15 of these teams in 21 days, to deploy them on the fourth, by, be ready to deploy in support of NORTHCOM and our North by the 4th of April. 85 personnel per team, all medical professionals. So everything was going along, we had a good plan. We, we had some of our own airplanes, that helps a lot in terms of moving folks around. The problem was about three days before we were supposed to be ready, we had a little bit of a glitch with a couple teams getting all the way to uh, the 85 personnel that were required. So people who operate close to me know that's not acceptable. When I make a commitment to the chief of staff of the Army that we're going to do 15 teams, 85, I didn't, and I said not 84, not 83, 85, 
And in every video conference we had, uh, it was everybody understood that at the end of the day, the red dot was on the leader, the commander, the third component of the army to produce the capability. So about two days before we were supposed to do it, finds out somebody thinks, oh, it may take us a couple more days to do X, Y, Z. So I was standing on the tarmac in Milwaukee, about ready to get on a, on a G35 to go some other place, or U, a, U, a U35. And I got my little map and I got my little sheet and I know where all the teams are and everything. And we set up a conference call. I don't know if you remember this. We set up a conference call. We got all the senior leaders in the medical community in the Army, all, all flag officers, on, on this conference call. And so we had a little conversation. It was pretty much a one-way conversation. It started off a two-way conversation. It ended up being a one-way conversation. And, and I was fairly emphatic. That's fair, right? Fairly emphatic that we're going to do this because this is, a, this is about a strategic conversation about, about the readiness and the viability and, and, the, and the relevance of a component of the Army that is responsible for the essentially the medical infrastructure of the, of the Department of Defense when it comes to operational capabilities. So we get to the end of it, and I was, you know, I was feeling good in the sense that, you know, how leaders sometimes, or if, if you're a leader like me, once you've sort of had your say and you've given everybody sense, hey, this is, anybody got any questions? And the, m probably most of the docs in the Army Reserve weren't used to having a conversation with a three-star quite like that. But they're, I'll just say, <laughs> Their shield was sitting right over there. That, he's sitting right over there now. <laughs> Their shield said, he said, no, boss, I think we're good. And that was it. And I was able to just, because he, he, what he was saying was, chill out. We got this. Everybody's got your message. And then he had to go clean up on aisle five, do all kinds of, I'm sure, all kinds of damage control with the medical community of the Army. But, but we did it reinvented and deployed Army medicine in less than three weeks out of a reserve component. Now, I'm just telling you, most people, to include senior leadership of the Army, did not think we could do it. And guess what? We did. We did. America's Army Reserve delivered, okay? So I tell you that story to tell you that all of us as leaders lead in our own way, and I would never expect leaders to change their style if that's changing their stripes. But I would encourage leaders to look for teammates to help you balance off a little bit so you got a little bit of law and order working at the same time. And that's, what, that's, what, that's how you drive synergistic effects. So um, I'll leave you with that. Um, I will say this. I mentioned a minute ago... Um, the, the American experiment. And I got to tell you, um, and everybody's got their own view, I think, of this. But, if, but I think if you think about it just in terms of it really being an experiment about our ability to govern ourselves. Govern ourselves. I mean, and, and, and do it in a way that enables us to have conversation across policy divides. And, and, to, and to, as best we can, embrace strategic empathy so that we are able to understand why people who don't necessarily agree with us on policy may not necessarily be wrong. We just have a disagreement. But in a, in a, in a, in a representative democracy, the way we work through that disagreement is by treating each other with, with respect and dignity. And I would submit that this nation will survive as a constitutional democracy so long as we embrace and elevate leaders of competence and character and that we don't confuse competence and character with celebrity and cynicism. So as we move forward, I would just say this. I don't know where, what they're doing. I know, so she's the, she, well, by the way, I got to say this. And I know I'm running long, and they're going to pull the hook here in a second. But she's already published two books. She's way ahead of me. I'm very upset about it. I've already said that <laughs> privately. I'm saying it publicly. And she's also now the CEO, CEO uh, of, of, of her own organization. Um, Rest in grace. And, I, and so, I, so I, know you're, I know something's going to get traction there. There's no doubt in my mind. 
And he mentioned a little bit about what he's thinking, and he may talk a little bit more about that. But I'll just say this. This country now more than ever needs leaders of character and competence, regardless of their thoughts on any particular policy. This isn't about policy. This is about norms. This is about, this is about treating each other with dignity and respect and being able to communicate civilly and, to, and disagree agreeably and work it out. You know, we all knew how to do that when we were in the sandbox when we were five, right? And if you didn't figure it out, somebody helped you. Um, so I'm, I'm counting on Lieutenant General, almost retired, soon to be retired, A.C. Roper, to keep pounding as we press on into tomorrow. And it's an honor to be here. I appreciate you all showing up. Doug, I appreciate you correcting me on the spot. I'll probably make the mistake again tomorrow, but it's not because I'm ignoring you. I just want you to know that. All right? Okay. Thank you for your service. Thank you for everything you've done for this nation. And thank all y'all for supporting and helping build. And by the way, saving, saving him from killing himself with that <laughs> shell with a hammer. Okay? Okay. Thanks for showing up. Cool. Thank you, Lieutenant General Lucky. At this time, we would like to invite General Van Herc to present Lieutenant General Roper with the Defense Distinguished Service Medal. Southwest border, 
a small thing called the Chinese spy board. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the office when I was talking to the president. He was there advising me. I couldn't have asked for a better partner, a better leader, than AC Roper uh, to be my right hand for more than two and a half years. And so thank you, AC. I appreciate it. I, I, you're going to get to hear the declaration. It probably doesn't cover 10% of what this man has done for the country, for these commands. I say commands. Not only is he the deputy of NORTHCOM, He's also the element commander of uh, NORAD for the, the U.S. Army Command. And so uh, thank you so much for doing it. If you don't mind, if you come up here, we'll present this and uh, make it a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Attention to orders. Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, United States Army, distinguished himself by exceptionally meritorious service as Deputy Commander, United States Northern Command, and Vice Commander, North American Aerospace Defense Command, Peterson Space Force Base, from June 2021 to May 2024. During this period, Lieutenant General Roper's strategic leadership was instrumental in the most robust and dynamic transformation in the command's history. His strategic influence resulted in unified synchronization within the commands and across the joint force, which advanced a globally integrated approach to homeland defense. During multiple complex crises, Lieutenant General, Lieutenant General Roper helped direct and manage defense efforts against Russian long-range aviation, North Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles, Russian and Chinese out-of-area maritime operations, and a Chinese high-altitude surveillance balloon within U.S. airspace. Lieutenant General Roper inspired consistent operational and organizational excellence throughout the coronavirus disease response. Operation Allies Welcome, which supported over 84,000 Afghan refugees, and the first kinetic engagement of a hostile object over North America since World War II. His leadership and passion to serve the people of the United States and Canada helped pioneer the concept our homelands are not a sanctuary, and they require robust future homeland defense capabilities. The distinctive accomplishments of Lieutenant General Roper culminate a long and distinguished career and reflect great credit upon himself, the United States Army, and the Department of Defense. Thank you, General Van Hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Chaplain Harewood, if you could please join Lieutenant General Roper after remarks. Good afternoon. Sir, I'm here on behalf of 700 Reserve Army chaplains serving over 190,000 soldiers and their families, and also on behalf of the 1,500 plus active duty chaplains serving over 1.5 million family members, just to simply say thank you for setting the, the comprehensive standards and for teaching us that the time to have the map is before we enter into the woods. <laughs> because if we're looking for the map in the woods, we're already lost. <laughs> Sir, you have taught us to value relationships. You have challenged us to embrace change, especially when unexpected. You have modeled how to be disciplined, dedicated, and devout. You've inspired us how to cultivate a spirit of personal and organizational excellence in all that we do. And you have, you have admonished us to lead a lasting legacy of livid but lovely servant leadership trail. Today, on behalf of the Chief of Chaplains, I'm here to present you the highest honor 
the Army chaplaincy confers upon the leader who has gone above and beyond this earthly cause to the cause that reverberates into eternity. Because it is not what we leave to our children that matters. You said that. It's what we leave in them that will guarantee their, sac their sacrifice and their survival. You held up our hands, and we thank you. I'll now read the certificate from the order of Aaron and Hur, beginning with a passage from the Bible, Exodus 17, 8 through 13. The warriors of Amalek came to fight against the people of Israel at Rephidim. Moses instructed Joshua to issue a call to arms to the Israelites to fight the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up the rod in his hands, Israel prevailed. But whenever he rested his arms at his side, the soldiers of Amalek prevailed. Moses' arms finally became too tired to hold up the rod any longer. So Aaron and Hur rolled a stone for him to sit on, and they stood on each side, holding up his hands until the sunset. As a result, Joshua and his troops overcame the army of Amalek. Now therefore be it known to all that the order of Aaron and Hur is conferred upon Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, Jr. for exceptionally meritorious service and steadfast support to the, army, to the United States Army Chaplain Corps while serving throughout his career which he is concluding as the 10th Deputy Commander of United States Northern Command and Vice Commander of the North American Aerospace Defense Command. At every level and position in his civilian career, whether as a police chief or a commanding general, he has provided unwavering servant leadership to God and country. His leadership, devotion, and integrity throughout his career provides an inspiring example with a lasting impact on soldiers, civilians, and their family members. His actions reflect great credit upon himself, the Army Chaplain Corps, and the United States Army. Thank you, Chaplain. Lieutenant General Roper has received letters of congratulations and certificates from the President, the Senate, the House of Representatives, the state of Alabama, and numerous military leaders. We invite you to view these uh, on presentation table after the ceremony. Lieutenant General Lucky, could you please join Lieutenant General Roper? The United States Army recognizes our service members would not be able to succeed without the unwavering support, commitment, and understanding from their families. It is only fitting at this transition from one chapter of life to the next, we honor these individuals who played such a critical role in their service member's career. At this time, we would like to recognize General Roper's wife, Edith, for the remarkable support she has given him throughout his career. Miss Edith, would you please join Lieutenant General Roper and Lieutenant General Lucky on the stage? Lieutenant General Lucky will present Mrs. Edith Roper with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Public Service Award. <laughs> For distinguished public service to the Department of Defense in a succession of voluntary initiatives to the service members and families of the United States Armed Forces from August 2014 to April 2024. During this period, Mrs. Roper's patriotism and sincere personal involvement in the welfare of service members and their families earned her profound respect from the military community. An ambassador of goodwill and an example for military spouses, she had a significant, lasting, and positive impact on the quality of life for military families. Her presence and support throughout countless domestic and international senior leader engagements exhibited total devotion and commitment to our nation, service members, civilians, and families. An effective advocate for the military community, she exemplified the values of patriotism, citizenship, selfless service, and personal sacrifice. The distinctive accomplishments of Mrs. Edith Roper reflect great credit upon herself and the Department of Defense.
this time, Mrs. Roper will place the Army Retirement Pin upon Lieutenant General Roper's lapel. The Army Retirement Pin symbolizes retiring from active duty and the beginning of the next chapter in their lives. Captain Roper Savage and Ms. Amber Roper, could you please join Lieutenant General Roper on the stage? Let's see, we'll do, uh, let's see, we'll. Will Lieutenant General Roper's brothers and sisters please join Lieutenant General Roper on the stage? Brown. <laughs> you, 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 my sister too. <laughs> Thank you. You may all take your seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the reading of the retirement order. Attention to orders. Lieutenant General A.C. Roper. The people of the United States express their thanks and gratitude for your faithful service. Your contributions to the defense of the United States of America are greatly appreciated. You are released from active duty and you will be placed on the retired list in the grade of Lieutenant General effective 1 June 2024 per Army Regulation 600-8-7 by order of the Secretary of the Army. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, Command Sergeant Major Darlington, retired, U.S. Army, and Staff Sergeant Wolf will come forward to case Lieutenant General Roper's personal colors. The use of the star to signify the rank of general officer can be traced to a June 1780 decree by General George Washington during the War of American Independence. Legend has it that General Washington chose the star as the symbol, the symbol of general officer rank in honor of its use in the Allied French Armed Forces. The star is the oldest continuously used rank in the United States military. The Army authorizes individual flags to those who warrant them by virtue of their office. The United States Army has incorporated the use of flags to signify the presence of a general officer and the flag remains with the general officer upon retirement in his home.
Thank you, Command Sergeant Major Darlington and Staff Sergeant Wolf. Captain Roper Savage, will you please join Lieutenant General Roper? Lieutenant General Roper's daughter, Captain Roper Savage, will give Lieutenant General Roper his last salute. As we close one chapter today, we know that the Roper legacy lives on in Captain Roper Savage's continued service to our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, United States Army, retired. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Somebody say roll tide. That <sighs> just to help me. That just to help me get it back together. Uh, when we rehearsed the suit, I didn't cry. Um, so thank you to our senior leaders. I know how busy you are. Uh, General Whiting, space is our biggest don't war fighting domain, and here you are sitting here. General Guillo, I know that we were doing a calendar sync a few weeks ago, and you had travel, and you said, no, I'm going to be here for the DCOM's retirement ceremony, and here you are, and Ms. Guillo. General Van Hurt, you told me you have a lot of time since you're retired, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think you're, you're, you're out there giving it. You're out there serving. You're out there making a difference, and thank you. Uh, to the mayor, thank you for being here. I look forward to future conversations around faith and leadership and look forward to expanding that relationship even more to the CSAIL. Thank you so much. Uh, to the retired CSMs, thank you so much. Everyone who's here, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. To, as we often say, nothing just happens. And so to everyone who was a part of putting this on, all the work that went on behind the scenes, uh, protocol team, academy wins, color guard, Padre Olive, Chapman Harewood, uh, Team CSAIL who's assisted us, Team DCOM who's absolutely fabulous. My front office is just, just amazing. To my family, I'm going to talk about you in more in just a moment. And we're just so honored to, to have you here. So I'm going to move around a little bit. Uh, and so what I see here in the audience is a compilation and integration of my four families. So my natural family, so supportive through the years, an all-star family, so beautiful. My wife, 39 years of marriage, uh, and I'm going to talk about you even more later, uh, just decorated my life. To my beautiful daughters, just, I see your mom in you. She says she sees me in you. I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> but you're so amazing. To my siblings, my brother Avery, who's, he's one of the reasons I'm standing here. Because he taught me resilience at an early age. <laughs> uh, 
And so he taught me lessons. He shared the story about me hitting a bullet with a hammer. I was trying to take the gunpowder out of it, and I thought hitting it with a hammer would be the right thing to do. <laughs> and then it fired in my hand and blew off half of my fingers. And so, uh, but I could not share a story about you. So he taught me resilience because I used to play with little green army men all the time. And I would line them up. They'd be in tactical formations. I'd have my snipers in overwatch position. I'd have my tanks. I'd have my, my, my infantrymen. And I'd get them all lined up perfectly. And he'd come over there and just kick them all down. <laughs> and the fight would be on then. We'd be fighting. And so he taught me resilience. He taught me no plan survives first contact. <laughs> he, he also taught me to fight for your men. And so. We would fight every time he would do that. So, so, so my, my natural family is here, my military family, thank you so much. Just through the years, you've, you've been absolutely amazing to the NORAD NORTHCOM staff. Uh, no one does it better. Every action officer, all the hours we spent together prepping for all the Pentagon meetings that the deputy is, is responsible for, hundreds and hundreds of hours. To the leadership across the staff, led by the chief of staff, thank you, thank you, thank you. My law enforcement family is here. And so that's family number three. And so we have so many leaders from across the nation. Birmingham Police Department is here in, in strong support. My entire front office, when I was chief of police for a decade, they're, they're here. I think they want to make sure I was actually retiring. And, uh, <laughs> And so we have David Boggs, retired police chief, who we taught the, uh, an FBI leader, law enforcement executive development group together, he and his wife having tough conversations across the nation regarding law enforcement and the future of law enforcement and how we lead our way through it. Then my community family is here. And so there are so many great friends led by the mayor and I mean, from our church, I see Bob and Trish back there, the Padre, we go to the same church, the CCL goes to the, I mean, it's just an absolutely amazing. Uh, we have Marvin Campbell here, who is the president of the US uh, element of all of the navigators. We have Jerry Vreeman and his wife here. They're doing all kinds of amazing work in leadership and obscurity network. He just got back from Africa this weekend. We were texting. He said, I, I'm at the airport, just returned from Africa. And he's here also. And this Colorado Springs community is just so supportive of their military. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Let me also recognize the person, the friend who traveled the greatest distance. That's Raymond Times. Raise your hand, Raymond. Uh, he came in from Nova Scotia, and uh, so yeah. The way he and I met, I was speaking at a law enforcement conference in, in British Kelowna, and he said it was the most boringest conference he's ever been in. <laughs> and he was walking out to leave. He put his hand on the doorknob. It was at a nice hotel, and he heard them introduce me. And uh, I got up to speak, and he heard the first couple of sentences, and he said, I need to stay here to hear this chief of police speak. So he tells his, his, this other person who traveled there that he was going to get me to come to Canada and speak at their conference. And the friend said, there's no way you can do that. So my wife wants want to go to the mall that night, so we go to the mall, and lo and behold, someone walks up to me and says, hey, I was at the conference today, and you were the best thing there, <laughs> and I want you to come to Canada. And I said, okay, uh, here's my card. Approximately two and a half years later, the phone rings, and I think Henry, he was, he was my exec executive officer at the time, and he retired as a deputy chief of the Birmingham PD. He walks into the office, and he says, hey, chief, there's somebody on the phone. They said they talked to you like two or three years ago about coming to Canada. <laughs> and I said, I remember that conversation. And so he's been a great friend. And now working in his headquarters, it's great that I got good friends in Canada. Uh, we got Rita back here, who's also a community friend here, so, so thank you for being here. So I'm the retiree, 
But I just want to talk and thank you. I want to talk about stories and how our stories intertwine and create this beautiful mosaic of life. So I often say every person has a story. And as an Army Reserve soldier, we have two stories, a civilian story and an Army story. And as a leader, our people show up with their stories every day. They show up with their equipment, their training, their excellence, their experience, but they show up with their stories. And those stories make us unique. Those stories are individual, and those stories give us diversity. And so as leaders, we have to meet people where they are. So my, so my story began at the age of 17. The stuff my brother said before, let's discount that. My, <laughs> my story began at 17 because I'm a list person. And I made my first list, real list, at 17. Graduating high school with the memory book, the last page asks, what do you want to accomplish in life? And as a goofy 17-year-old kid, I wrote three things. I said, I want to be a police officer. I want to join the Army. And I want to marry a sweet, pretty woman who understood me. <laughs> That's the quote. That's what I wrote at 17. And so I followed that same list. And so I would submit to you that in a nation with challenges, I like the way General Lucky described it, you can come from the wrong side of the tracks and everybody count you out, and you can still accomplish your list. And you're never too old to make a list. And so that list has directed my steps and guided me, and I think there's power in the written word. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2 says, take the vision, write it down, make it plain said that he who reads it can run. So that tells me that the written vision has to be clear and it will give you motivation for action. It will provide a level of accountability and a level of clarity. Now, I didn't realize that at 17, but as I look back, I can say that doubt has killed more dreams than failure ever will. And so writing it down gave me a sense of clarity. So I took ROTC, junior ROTC in high school for four years. So I get to college. I'm an early commissioning student. I'm 19 years old when I received my second lieutenant bar. I'm 19. I am as goofy as they come. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't know what I'm doing. But I had a group of NCOs that no doubt in my mind had a meeting. And they said, if we don't help him, he'll get us all killed. <laughs> I, know, I know they said that. They, I know they said it. They said, we've got to help him. He has a good heart. And if we don't, he'll get us all killed. So, I'm warned, so they, they just wrapped their arms around me. I had enough humility to listen. And they just, at that lieutenant stage, they were just an amazing group. So all of, my, all of my NCOs, please stand. If you're an NCO in here, please stand. Yeah. 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 We have amazing officer leadership, but this is my opinion. You're the reason we're the greatest fighting force the world has ever known. When, when, when other leaders show up, they say, I want some of those, and they point to our sergeants. But it took us hundreds of years to form that NCO Corps. And you continue to give, and you continue to train and mold and mentor young lieutenants. And so I was at the airport yesterday, and some of you who are connected with me on LinkedIn, I went to pick up family, and uh, I saw a, a lieutenant I didn't know it was a lieutenant at the time because I saw him from the back, but I saw an Army uniform. And I walk up, I'm in civilian clothes, I introduce myself. No, I didn't. First I say, hey, how are you? What's your story? He goes, oh, I'm such and such. And I go, oh, uh, uh, I'm, I'm Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, so he's the first lieutenant. You know, he, he, <laughs> you know, you know he, he, his backbone got real. And he was just so respectful even before he knew who I was. And within one minute of starting that conversation, he said, sir, what can I do to be a better leader? 
And the first thing I mentioned was your relationship with your NCOs. At the lieutenant stage, that's so important. And I shared some other things with him. And, uh, and so he's a mentee that I just picked up this weekend. <laughs> so, so let me mention this. So I was a second lieutenant then. I became a first lieutenant. And I worked with a, a powerful group of second lieutenants. They were just, we were all eager, untrained. Uh, one of them was second lieutenant Courtney Washington. He and his wife are over here. Uh, <laughs> Courtney was the kind of guy who would just say it like it was. And as a company XO, that didn't go over well with the commander, who would often look at me to try to explain what Courtney was talking about. And so it's good to have him here. So the Army provided so many opportunities for me to learn, grow, and develop. Uh, on Sunday, September 9th, 2001, I took command of a battalion headquarters. It's the same battalion I had deployed with during the first Gulf War, and we didn't do really well. We were mis misaligned with mission and everything else. And I would often say, if I'm never in command, I would do X, I would do Y, I won't do this. So on that Sunday morning, September 9th, I took command of that unit. Two days later, we were attacked on September 11th, which was the, the impetus for, for NORTHCOM to be birthed. And then two months later, we deployed. I had been with the unit two drill weekends, landing in Kuwait, where we met, I think at that time, Captain Larry Hearn, whose job was to track units in the theater. He had no idea we were coming. <laughs> and so he's sitting here right now. And uh, uh, it caused some tension because I ended up fighting for my people, because that's what Avery taught me. And, uh, <laughs> Because we were being double tapped, the Third Army, Third Army, the, the higher headquarters were using my people for uh, additional duties, and then the Army Reserve headquarters that he was a part of was using them for additional duties. So we were getting double tapped, and, and I didn't think it was right, so I started fighting about it. And uh, so we had some, he, he was good, but there were some on the staff, if you remember, I was fighting. And, uh, <laughs> And so I then led that unit into Afghanistan. We were the first Army unit to let, set foot into Afghanistan. We got there before the 101st. Their, their, their advance party was there. And when their main body arrived, we were involved in a firefight when they, land, when they were landing. And, and so worked our way through all of that. And somewhere over the course of my career, I ran across some amazing leaders who mentored me, Colonel Easter, over here, and, and he and his wife, and, and, and he just has an amazing mentoring network, and he helped me so many times. And uh, I was talking to General Nichols, another one of my mentors, we're all in a network together, uh, just this week, he wanted to be here. And I said, sir, I thank you because I wouldn't be a general officer without you. He says, no, you're, you're totally wrong there. I said, no, sir, when I was the G3 of this one-star headquarters, I was, I love that job. And he comes in as the new commander and says, I want you to be my chief of staff. And I go, no, sir. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really happy doing this. And I just, I've only been doing it seven months. And, and I'm, I'm really, he says, no, I really want you to. I said, sir, I'm your youngest colonel. I'm your youngest. And so if you don't mind, I, I, I can keep doing this. And you can pick one of the senior colonels. <laughs> He comes back an hour later and he says, I just had a meeting with all the other colonels and they said, you should be the chief of staff. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you know how that goes. When you're not in the room, you get volunteered. But I tell that story because that was the position I was in when I got selected to be a brigadier general. And so I thank him for, and I did tell him, sir, I'll be your acting chief while you select someone to be your permanent chief. And so I was chief of staff for three years. And, uh, <laughs> and so from that, uh, I commanded the, the 415th out of South Carolina. Uh, I was the Joint Task Force Ops Commander under Army North with the uh, Seaburn Enterprise. And I ran across CSM Moore. He's here with, with, with his wife. And so thank you. And, and great. We had units in eight states. And then I got selected for a two-star command. And, uh, and from there, I commanded the, the 80th, as General Leckie mentioned. And I mentioned that because we got a 
crew of people that I work with from Chaplain Harewood to General Wallace and, and, and General Powell. We, we were together in, in the Seaburn world and from that command I commanded the 76th. That was all the Army Reserve chemical units. And Doug Cherry over here was my, was my DCG, one of the smartest minds I've ever ran across. And Howard Gick, he worked with us. And, and it's just a network of amazing leaders. And that's when he called. <laughs> and he said, hey, Rope, there's something I want you to do for me. What's that, sir? Well, first of all, when his staff called out to, to, to schedule the call, it's not often you talk to the three-star who's running the whole Army Reserve, 200,000 soldiers deployed, I mean, everywhere, just a, an amazing mission set. And so they said, sir, he'd like to talk to you. And I go, well, I don't think I've done anything wrong. <laughs> uh, and so they scheduled the call, and he gets on the phone and says, hey, Rope, there's something I want you to, to, to do for me. What's that, sir? Come up to the Pentagon, be my deputy chief. And I said, well, sir, uh, uh, I'm retiring from the Birmingham Police Department. He says, well, the time is perfect. <laughs> and he knows I say it, it's not perfect unless Miss Edith says it's perfect. <laughs> and I talked to her and she said, it sounds like an adventure. And, and, and away we went and I, I enjoyed being your deputy chief. Uh, I remember asking him about the job duties once I got in there. He said, well, Rope is very simple. Your job is to do everything I can't do and everything I don't want to do. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And one of the things he doesn't like to do is dress up in these uniforms. <laughs> so one day I'm in the Pentagon and I'm dressed up and he goes, what you dressed up for? I said, sir, so you don't have to. <laughs> and so for him to be dressed up now, I thank you for, for, for hosting this because I know, I know what this means. I know what this means. He then comes to me one day and says, oh, hey, Rope, I want you to go down to Fort Bragg and, and just run, be the DCG operations. And, we, had, we got like 27, 28 two-star commands in the Army Reserve and America's Army Reserve. And he said, I know you got to talk to Miss Edith. And so <laughs> talked to her and away we went to Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty for a couple of years. Had an amazing team there with B.G. Cooley and, and, and Major General Miles Davis and uh, uh, my deputy over here, now Brigadier General Davis and Lieutenant Colonel uh, Clancy. And, and so just a great team, all of them are here. And so we did become law and order. But what's really the reason he's, there's a lot of reasons he's hosting this ceremony. He knows this mission set of NORTHCOM NORAD after being the chief of staff for four years. He also knows the Army Reserve. And he's the one who said, Rope, I'm going to put you in to compete for this position I'm in now. He said, I'm going to put you in because I think you'd be perfect with your interagency experience uh, and everything that you've done in your career. And, and you got the leadership acumen. And so he, he put us in. And uh, I had the interview with General Van Hurt. And we had a call set up one night. And uh, when I called you, first of all, I was cleaning up my office the other day. I still have the preparation folder on Northcom. It was a green folder about that thick. I read your confirmation testimony. I looked up every challenge Northcom had at the time. I was just prepared, and you didn't ask me none of that stuff. <laughs> 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 didn't ask none of it. And so uh, he did recommend, uh, made the selection. It's not a nomination officially to the president signs it. But uh, I will simply say that preparation is a down payment for opportunities. And, and so we were prepared, and he didn't ask a lot of those questions. That was okay, but that helped set a foundation when uh, we, the nomination process went through. My nomination was not smooth, that whole process. Uh, Secretary of Defense Esper wanted to get the packet across to the White House before the presidential election, and uh, he signed it, and, and then he uh, was removed from duty a week later, so my packet sat in the White House. Then a new Secretary of Defense came on board, Secretary of Defense Miller. The packet had to go back to the Pentagon because it had the previous Secretary of Defense signature on it, so it sat at the Pentagon, and then he signed it. I mean, when he became the Secretary, not, not like my packet was number one priority. And so, so he signed it, it goes back to the White House, then the election happens, then it goes back to the Pentagon, and so General Van Herc sent word, he said, just hang in there, it's gonna get through, it's gonna get through the process. 
So then the third Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Defense Austin, current Sec Sec Def, he signed it. It goes back to the White House again for the third time. Then it makes it to the Senate and I'm confirmed and this has been a fabulous assignment. Uh, and so over these 42 years, I just want to leave you with a couple of things I've picked up. And, and so I think there, there are lessons that have served me well. And number one is value people. We can be metric driven. Uh, we can be return on investment driven. But at the end of the day, it's about people. And so no one is successful alone. Success is not a solo project. We have to value people. We have to see their potential. And as leaders, we have to put them in positions to develop that potential. I had a leader when I was uh, teaching at the Montgomery Police Academy. This is in uh, 1987. I know his name. I will never forget it. Uh, I went to him and I said, sir, I would like to learn more about leadership because I really want to grow and develop in that area. And he burst out and started laughing. He laughed so hard that he was crying. And he was pointing at me saying, you, you want to learn about leadership? And uh, I'm writing a book on life, legacy, and leadership. And I mentioned that story and I call it motivating memories. That throughout life we have motivating memories and that memory continues to motivate me today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> roll time, roll time, yeah. That someone could look at you and size you up or size you down. So number two, make it better. Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, he says, you may not be able to change the whole world, but you can change your corner of it. Yes. And so making it better, continuous improvement is critically important. So you can build a pocket of greatness right where you are. I've been saying make it better for so many years that my former deputy chief sitting here put it on a plaque and had it hanging in the Birmingham Police Department. Make it better. <laughs> because our job was to make those communities better and make them safer. Then lastly, I would say, leave a legacy. Value people, make it better, leave a legacy. Not only should the organization be better because you're here, but someone's life should be better because you're here. And so my grandfather was a World War I soldier, as General Lucky mentioned, deployed to France with the 366 Infantry. Buffalo soldier, segregated unit, Corporal William Roper. And uh, he left a legacy. I have a copy of his service papers at home. It's what we call the DD-214 now. And on the back of it where it says character, colon, the word excellent is typed there. That even though he was treated less than human, fighting for a nation, fighting for freedom in a foreign land that he didn't have at home, his character was excellent. So legacy is not about valuables. It's about values. It's not about wealth. It's about wisdom. It's not about what you bought, but what you build. And that's the legacy he left for us. My dad was a civil rights foot soldier as a young man marching in the streets of Birmingham for, for civil rights. Uh, one day, the, the day that you see those, those videos and those pictures of the police and the fire department with the hoses and he was there, he and his friends had to run home because they didn't have time to get back to his car and the next morning, around two in the morning, granddad, Corporal William Roper, had to sneak through the back roads to take my dad to get his car <laughs> so they can avoid the police. And only in America can my dad's son grow up and be the chief of the police department that chased them down the street.
So I was leaving the Pentagon in winter of 19. And I saw a man, I was parked uh, toward the spot, toward the back of the, it got five sides, but back near the, the athletic center, athletic club. And it's snowing, it's dusk, I'm walking to my vehicle, and I see an older gentleman, I can hear the, the cart rolling. And I see an older gentleman pushing a cart. He's dapperly dressed. And I can tell from the cart that he had just retired. There's mementos, there's gifts, there's plaques on the cart. Well, of course, I've got to help him load that in. I, I just can't let him push that cart to, to the vehicle. So I go over, he gets to the vehicle first, pops the trunk. I walk over, he sees two stars, and he's like, oh, sir. I said, hey, let me, let me help you load this up. I said, well, tell me your story. Uh, did you just retire? And he told me. Uh, I don't know if it was snowflakes in his eyes, but he missed it up and told me his story. And we closed the trunk. I thanked him for his service, and he got in the vehicle to drive away. Snow is falling, his red tail lights are fading, and I said to myself, I hope they remember him. I hope he left a legacy. Because as his tail lights faded away, I turned to the Pentagon, the lights were bright. People were still working. So the legacy wasn't what was on the cart and what was in the trunk, the legacy is the people who were still in the building. And so I submit to you that I'm now the person loading up stuff into the trunk of the car. And this stuff is so beautiful, it's so important, but it pales in comparison to working with you, living with you, serving with you, and that's the legacy that I will remember. General Luckett used to always say, we have two things most people don't have. Number one, we have a team that we're willing to die for. Number two, we have a mission, we have a purpose to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And it's been my honor to serve with each of you. So let me go back to that list as I close. Become a police officer, join the Army, marry a sweet, pretty woman who understood me. <laughs> I didn't realize that Action item number three empowered action items number one and two. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. She was the engine that made number one and number two possible. So caring, so giving, so supportive, deployments, you name it. Two of the most high stress jobs in all of America, being a, a police chief in an urban city and being a leader in the military. And I'm coming and going. At one time, I had three phones, three iPads, and, and two laptops. And she, now she keeps me straight now. There's, there's times where she had to say, hey, sweetie, you need to put that stuff down. <laughs> put it down. And you need someone to help you be better. And so she is helped me to grow and develop. And sweetie, I'm so excited about chapter three of our life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Roll tight. <laughs> Roll tight. And, and to my daughters, you two are just amazing. You're so loving and talented and I'm just, I'm just looking forward to everything that God has in store for you how each of you will impact the world. So I got gifts for it, little, little tokens for you so that way I can get myself together. <laughs> oh, thank you. So sweetie, oh. Mm. Uh -oh. Okay. And so we had a former chief of staff of the Army who would say, the strength of our nation is the Army. The strength of our Army is the soldiers. But the strength of the soldiers are their families. And so you all are my strength. And so uh, 
In February 2021, I was on a Zoom call with uh, General Colin Powell, and he was providing some mentoring to a group. And he said, you need to know when to get off the bus. He said, sometimes people stay on the bus too long. And I took sc screenshots of him, not knowing in a few months he would pass away. But when he said, you got to know when to get off the bus, that resonated. And so, sweetie, this bus has made a lot of stops over 42 years for we're getting off the bus. Let's go home. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, members of NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM will conduct a flag folding ceremony in honor of Lieutenant General Roper's 42 years of faithful service to his country. This long-standing military tradition pays respect to this iconic symbol of American identity and national pride. For more than 200 years, the American flag has been the symbol of our nation's unity, as well as a source of pride and inspiration for millions of citizens. Born on June 14, 1777, the Second Continental Congress determined that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternating between seven red and six white, and that the Union be 13 stars, white, in a blue field representing a new constellation. Between 1777 and 1960, the shape and design of the flag evolved into the flag presented before you today. The 13 horizontal stripes represent the original 13 colonies, while the stars represent the 50 states of the Union. The colors of the flag are symbolic as well. Red symbolizes hardiness and valor. White signifies purity and innocence. And blue represents vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Traditionally a symbol of liberty, the American flag has carried the message of freedom and inspired Americans both at home and abroad. Today, our flag flies on constellations of satellites that circle our globe and on Army posts and forward operating bases across the world. Indeed, it flies in the heart of every service member who serves our great nation. The sun never sets on the military nor on the flag we so proudly cherish. Since 1776, no generation of Americans has been spared the responsibility of defending freedom. Today's military members remain committed to preserving the freedom that others won for us for generations to come. By displaying the flag and giving it a distinctive fold, we show respect to the flag and express our gratitude to those individuals who fought and continue to fight for freedom at home and abroad. Since the dawn of the 20th century, military members have proudly flown the flag in every major conflict on lands and in skies around the world. It is their responsibility, our responsibility, to continue to protect and preserve the rights, privileges, and freedoms that we as Americans enjoy today. The United States flag represents who we are. It stands for the freedom we all share and the pride and patriotism we feel for our country. We cherish its legacy as a beacon of hope to one and all. Long may it wave.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as Pastor Sean Edwards comes forward and delivers the benediction. Well, I did get permission from General Roper retired to say a few words to, before I do the benediction, if y'all don't mind. Man, what an amazing milestone. Today is truly a testament of God's favor shown toward one man whose life is surrendered to the Lord. General Roper has exceeded odds, overcame many obstacles from humble beginnings of the inner city of all the way to the capital city. A remarkable journey that traveled by projects in Birmingham fueled with ambition that landed him at the Pentagon. I've had the unique opportunity of witnessing the favor of God, in other words, the acceptance, the goodwill, and the peripheral treatment of God on this man's life and several arenas, to have served with him under him in ministry under the same pastor at the same church for several years was truly a highlight. To have served with him under him in the United States Army Reserve was clearly an honor and a privilege. Why? Because I was witnessing a, a general officer in the making. Transformational leaders don't come around that often. But when they do, everyone around them are impacted. To have served with him under him while chief of Birmingham Police Department, the largest police department in the state of Alabama, was extremely beneficial to so many men and women who wore the badge, especially the citizens of Birmingham. The arena that stands out the most, though, were as I witnessed God's grace, which is his unmerited favor on General Roper's life, is in regards to his family. To have walked alongside and watched this man love and provide and protect his wife, Edith, for 39 years, his daughter, Crystal and Amber, and his family has been a joy to watch. If it had not been for the grace of God, things would have been a little more challenging. It's the grace that reminds us that it's God helping us with the weight of the assignment, with the weight of the title, with the weight of the position, with the weight of the responsibility. Because without God's help, mission failure is inevitable. But as we all know, the mission was a success, therefore mission complete. Now for the benediction. Now, God, we bless you today. Thank you for allowing us to experience such a wonderful and historic moment in the life of Lieutenant General Roper. God, you said no good thing will you withhold from those who walk uprightly and trust you. That favor and honor will be bestowed upon them. Almighty God, continue to bestow your blessing upon this man his family, as he transitions to his next, to his next assignment, bless him. To his next mission, bless him. To his next purpose, bless him. God, give him the wisdom of Solomon so that he may choose wisely in his next. Give him the courage of David that he may, he may face whatever new challenge lies ahead with boldness and confidence. And God, give him strength like Paul to endure the new journey with joyful unspeakable joy. Now, God, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, we thank you for travel and grace and arriving mercy. Now, may the strength of God sustain you. May the power of God preserve you. And may the hands of God protect you. And may the love of God go with you this day and forever. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Edwards. Lieutenant General Lucky, could you please join Lieutenant General Roper? The men and women of the United States military are proud to have served with Lieutenant General Roper and wish him and his family every success in their future endeavors. Please remain standing for the playing of the Army song. The words can be found on the back of your program.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. On behalf of Lieutenant General Roper and his family, thank you for attending. Please join Lieutenant General Lucky in congratulating Lieutenant General Roper and his family. The receiving line will form at the front of the stage. Additionally, General Roper and his family would like to invite you to stay for the reception. <laughs>